When you first open 3D Studio, you'll find a dialog in the middle of the screen that offers training videos and links to YouTube and websites. Take advantage of this if you can. Otherwise, you can just simply click to close and you'll see the interface for version 2010 and 11 looking much like we see here. I actually don't like this interface. The darker colors are harder on the eye and the 2009 color scheme is actually a lot easier to look at and their strategic spot color makes it a lot easier to identify parts of the interface. To change your interface to match up with 2009, go to the Customize pull down and pull down to where it says Custom UI and Default Switcher. You'll see inside here a list. We can find UI schemes and I find 3ds Max 2009. I'm going ahead and select that, set, and it'll reload the interface to match up with 2009. I'm going to go ahead and close the rest of the dialog here. There may be parts of that interface that, that will require you to have to restart to have them fully available. We'll do that if necessary. So this interface is much easier, I think, on the eye. There's little pieces of color here and there. It's easier to quickly identify and find things like the snaps and um, the um, elements of the interface that are active, which are always indicated in a kind of gold color. You also notice that the bounding box around this viewport is gold, meaning this is currently the active viewport. If I draw anything, it's going to be uh, drawn through this viewport, but displayed simultaneously in the other three quadrants. So let's look at the basic layout of 3D Studio Max. The distinguishing feature of 3D Studio in comparison to other software that you might use is the use of the modifier stack. Most of this is all accessed from the command panel which sits here on the right hand side of the screen. You see it's comprised of a series of tabs and each of these tabs correspond to various tools that you might make use of. Let's look at the first tab, Create. Inside here we see that um, we can create a number of things. You can create geometries, shapes, lights, cameras, helpers, space warps, and systems. So I'm going to create a, a standard geometry right here. And you'll notice even within this, there's further um, geometries that can be produced. So this is a very deep interface. It's not just simply make boxes, spheres, cylinders, and so forth. I am going to start by clicking on box and then moving out to my perspective viewport and right clicking to make it active. You'll notice now that the viewport here is active because it's got the gold outline. I'm going to simply click and drag and drag up and now I've got a box in here. Now while this box is still active I can still make adjustments to the box size and length, width, and height. But once I let go of the box, by selecting some other portion of the interface, you'll notice that there's no longer a highlight on it. If I want to make changes to the box at this point, now I move over to what's called the Modify tab, the next tab over. You see the same parameters that go with that box exist inside Modify, and now we can make further adjustments to height, width, and length. Okay. Something else that I want to draw your attention to here right now uh, while we're quickly going over portions of the interface are the subdivisions of the surfaces that make up the sides of this box. By default, there is one polygon that describes each of these sides. Most often you want to subdivide the box into an appropriate, to a number of polygons that are appropriate for the task at hand. If I go ahead and click on here and add extra subdivisions, it's not immediately apparent to us in the 3D view we can actually see the extra subdivisions displayed out here in the orthographic projections. Now, should you like to see them in the 3D view, let's draw our attention to these three lists that are in the upper left-hand corner of every viewport. One of those allows us to make adjustments to how the viewport is displayed. You'll notice that this viewport is displayed as smooth and highlights. The other three viewports are displayed as wireframe. We also have a check area here for edged faces. If I go ahead and turn that on, it will allow me to reveal the surface subdivisions. And now I can actually see in real time the subdivisions that I may add or take away from the box. Okay, this is simply a box here, but we can produce uh, some interesting results just from this box and also convey the uh, fundamental behavior of 3D Studio that distinguishes it from other software. If I go to the modifier list here, beneath box one, 
you see there's a long list of modifiers that I can apply to this box. So for example, I'll find taper here and now I can make adjustments to taper and you'll notice that the box now tapers in one direction or another. We can change the axes of the taper and limit the effect and we can do further, make further adjustments inside this or any other modifier that we should add to box. Let's also add twist here just to make the point. I'm going to pull down to where it says twist and let's make a slight twist to this and maybe there's a bias. So we have a box that has two modifiers piled on top of it. Now these modifiers can be turned on and off. We have just the twist and no taper or just the taper and no twist or neither and we can move up and down in this stack. We can come back down to the box and make adjustments to the basic parameters of the box and we can also reveal um, all of the modifiers while making adjustments to the box so you can see change is taking place here. Now you're not going to be able to do this with everything exactly like I'm showing here because once objects get uh, more complex it's not as simple as what I'm showing uh, but this is the basic idea. Okay, other key things in the interface. If we go through the modifier tab we have create, a variety of geometries can be created here, lights and other features in the scene, the modification of anything placed in the scene, the structuring and organization of objects in the scene which won't have a huge impact on basic modeling this is essential um, to consider when it comes to animating uh, likewise with the motion control tab this is something that goes with animation we have the display tab which allows us to turn items on and off inside the scene so if I have items in my scene named I could come here and hide or unhide them and we have a utility tab across the top of the screen we have the other basic tools so we have move, rotate, scale, and scale comes in a variety of types, so uniform, non-uniform, squash, and so forth. And then on this side of the interface we see mirror and align. So these are kind of basic transform tools that we all make use of in any application. Right here in the middle we see snaps. So we have snaps in 2D, 2.5, and 3D modes. We have an angle snap and primarily these two snaps are what you're going to make the most use of. Um, if a snap is turned on, or if any tool is turned on, you see it's highlighted in yellow. I'm going to go ahead and turn those off for right now. Uh, we also have the crossing and window box. So right now, the tool that's active, if we go to select something out here in the scene by picking or crossing, uh, it picks up anything that touches. If we switch this over to window mode, um, it won't pick up the object unless I entirely window it. So we all know by now the distinction between these two. Uh, there's other methods to select by. We can set up a selection by using an irregular geometry, clicking around something to grab, and we can also use a paint. So I've gone ahead and quickly dropped in several geometries and uh, some other key features we need to point out here on the front end. If I have a geometry selected, of course, inside the Modify tab, we can make further adjustment to this. But at the very top, you see a name field, and I can give the object a name of my choosing. And it's really important to name your geometries. They're given generic names by default, and oftentimes it can be very difficult to find the geometries if you leave it just at the generic name. We can also make a change to this basic CAD color. Until a material's been placed, it'll render with just this basic CAD color. This is an object-oriented modeler, so this is the way for you to distinguish parts in the scene, is to see the, the various colors. If they're all green, uh, it gets very difficult to select various pieces. So you click on the color swatch next to the name, and we can give this a unique color that would allow us to find it in the scene. So now this one has yellow. And I might change the name here to say ball the sphere and we might say tower here let's say on the box and maybe we give the tower a color that's blue. I have three items in my scene help you see that we can use select by name as another method to get a hold of geometries in the scene. So uh, you get a list of all items in the scene across the top here is a series of filters that allows you at some point when there's thousands of items in your scene you want to quickly filter them out. I know what I'm looking for is just a geometry. 
so we could turn off space warps and cameras and lights and everything else. At some point you may simply want to find a certain light and you turn everything else off by light. Uh, if you have them all on here and there's thousands of items then there's just more information to comb through. To select something we can just simply pick it and then click OK. We can also um, select and highlight all of them or uh, you can use the control key and to pick up things that are discontinuous and then click OK and you would see those two items have been picked. Once something's been picked then we can use the move, scale, and rotate tools to manipulate the item or reposition it inside the scene. When an item is selected you'll see what's called the transform gizmo show up on top of the geometry and this is by default placed at the origin point of the geometry. So for a sphere, it's right at its center. And most of the geometries, it's built from the ground plane up, also at its center. And if you get a hold of the axes of this transform gizmo, they act like an ortho constraining movement. You'll also notice if I roll over this, there are planes that are highlighted. And if I select on that plane, then this would be sliding around on the Z, Y plane or this here would be sliding around on the Z, X plane and so forth. The transform gizmo looks slightly different for rotate or for scale. Uh, you'll see we have a sphere here that represents the uh, universe around that geometry and if you want to specifically constrain the movement or rotation or scaling of something then you take advantage of using the snaps. So when it comes to rotation I would clearly use my angle snap and if you want to make adjustments to any of the snaps simply right click on the snap button and you get a little pop-up that lets you make adjustments. So right now um, I'm looking at angle snap and I want to have this on so it snaps on nice five degree increments. While we're here we might also turn on our object snaps and uh, let's say at some point we're going to move one of these other items on the scene using vertex and grid points and I'll turn midpoint off for right now. So if I'm rotating this sphere you'll now notice that it is moving in five degree increments so allow us to really quickly and cleanly get to 90 degrees. With that turned off you'd be trying to eyeball this until it got to 90 degrees and you can't you can't really get to 90 degrees that way. Um, alternatively you could use the transform type in box down below here and you'll notice in fact right now it does say 90 degrees is what we just did. Um, this is an absolute mode so the sphere has been rotated 90 degrees and that's what shows inside the dialog. Now if we go to relative mode it would be 90 degrees from where it was last if I rotate this and the moment I've finished rotating and let go this box is cleared. So relative and absolute. Now alternatively we could scale and with scale it's the same thing. Um, we get a hold of the axes and it'd be scaling in one direction or the other or the plane here in the middle would scale this and this particular flavor of scaling uh, uniformly. We could also do non-uniform and squash versions of scale. When it comes to move um, I could reposition or move this item and use my object snaps. Let's go ahead and turn those back on and I might pick up the box here by its corner and place it on top of the cone right here and we'll notice that um, it's snapped right onto the point that's right here at the top of the cone. One other brief item to note which we'll get into in greater detail is the material editor. The material editor lets us set up basic materials uh, that are going to be used on the surfaces here and we also have the render setup which is essential for us to be able to get output so once we've modeled this, of course, we want to be able to uh, visualize or see the outcomes and that all has to be set up through the rendering output. And once this has been completed, we can quickly test a rendering just by clicking on uh, a quick render here. And you see right now I have my three objects in my scene. And we'll come back to, like I said, um, all of this stuff in short order. In the lower right hand corner we have the panning and zooming tools. You can also learn to take advantage of quick keys and mouse buttons to make this much more expedient. The playback controls here, this field, the time configuration, the keys and the timeline are all essential parts of building animations which are not covered in ARC 452.